Prostate cancer didn't kill me. Running for Secretary of State didn't kill me. Even working in the news industry for 20 years didn't kill me. I'm not dead. People keep asking me, Rick, what are you doing now? Started riding with right. Hi, I'm Rick Dancer. Welcome to Rick Dancer TV. What the heck is Rick Dancer TV? Well, we don't know either. We're making it up as we go, and hopefully it's not going to be a train wreck. Oh, it's not going to be a train wreck. I work with professional photographers. I was in the business for 20 years. When I left in 2008, then I lost a race for Secretary of State. Then I won a battle with prostate cancer. And in between all that, I started Rick Dancer Media Services. We do videos for websites for Lane County, cities of Cresswell, Cottage Grove, a whole host of other clients, and a lot of nonprofits. In doing that, we realize there's a lot of backstories that you're not getting on regular television. So we put them on the internet. We decided to bring them back to regular TV right here on KEVU. So enough of this. There's no commercials in this show, so you can still DVR it, but there's no commercials. We're going to get right to the stories. And this first one may tick you off. It should tick you off. When we put this online, it made a lot of people angry. Not at us and not at the story, but people in Lane County who are dumping their trash on Lane County lands. And wait till you meet the woman who has to pick up the garbage. This is how we like to think of Lane County, not this. Illegal dump sites are a growing problem in rural Lane County. You don't have to go far outside any city to find them. I think it's frustrating for all of us. On this day, we find nuisance abatement specialist Carolyn Francis cleaning up one of the largest illegal dump sites in the county just west of Cottage Grove. A little bit of trash tends to attract more trash. So I, we, it's best to know, you know, as soon as I know about stuff, I like to get out there and get it cleaned up and stay on top of it. If she doesn't stay on top of it, a trash bag becomes a magnet for more trash, and soon you end up with this. Volunteers come out to help. Cleaning up other people's garbage. The, I enjoy shooting as much as anybody, but I, it bothers me to see a mess like this. A Lane County Sheriff's work crew, the Bureau of Land Management, and private landowners like Warehouser are also on hand. Tom Hewlett says illegal dumps are a huge problem for landowners. Over the last couple of decades, little by little, Warehouser has been closing down their property, and the reason for it is, is uh, the theft of equipment, theft of timber, the litter, and uh, just the people that abuse the property. At the end of the day, 40 yards of illegal trash is removed. That's four and a half tons of illegally dumped garbage and 70 tires. Since the nuisance abatement program started in 2006, 1,130 illegal dump sites have been cleaned up. That's 255 tons of trash, 3,500 tires, 200 appliances, and more than 1,000 TVs and monitors, 255 sofas, and 154 mattresses. 62 citations are issued for littering. You can kind of see the clusters of the problem areas. Back in our office, Francis shows us the map. This is a map that we started um, when we first started the program in 2006, and the red pins are the large dump sites. That's only for two years, and I stopped because I couldn't fit any more pins in those same spots. So you're gonna take us out there and mm -hmm. show us what you do, mm -hmm. and the lengths that you go to to find these people? Yeah. Would they be surprised? They usually are, um, because if, if we end up in court and I show them how I caught them, they're like, you did what? To, down to what little receipt? And yeah, so I'll dig down to every last little piece um, in the dump site. All right, let's go. Okay. I take reports of illegal dumps um, on Lane County roads. I investigate them dig through the trash, try to figure out who did it, write tickets for it. I can also require them to clean it up. There's a garbage bag right on Lane County Road. Sure enough, right in the bottom of the bag, a bank receipt with the name and account number of the owner of this trash. And why do you do that? Um, for evidence. Make sure I have a picture of me pulling it out of the bag. And if you look, most of this is recycling. Here's newspaper. This is recyclable. Most of this stuff is. Um, so really there's no excuse for it to be on the side of the road. Francis says 75% of the illegal trash she finds is recyclable. I love my job. 
I would have never guessed that this is what I was going to do, but um, I really do like keeping Lane County roads clean and trying to hold illegal dumpers accountable for their behavior. At the next site, a mattress and adult diapers. That's all diapers. The people of Lane County are Frances's eyes and ears. She can't do this without you. They're the biggest help to me because they keep a close eye on the road and they call in stuff. Um, you know, a lot of times they'll even come out when I'm cleaning it up and thank me and, you know, appreciate that, that we do what we do. It's a never-ending job. Francis sees improvement in some areas, but illegal dumpers find new spots, new surprises, and the only way to stop them is to keep watching. Down the road, the remains of someone's bathroom remodel. Most of it's recyclable. This mess would have cost less than $10 to take to the landfill. Because this just goes in the metal bin. New technology is also catching up with those who dump illegally. Is the thing that the people need to remember is that camera may not be the only camera on us right now at a dump site. Maybe not this one, but a particular dump site. There may be other cameras watching from somewhere. Mm -hmm. You're really out to, to stop this, aren't you? Yes. Yeah, we want to do whatever it takes to stop finding this on the side of our Lane County roads. If the illegal trash is traced back to you, it's your problem and you're fine whether you put it there or not. From the time you generate the trash until it's recycled or disposed of properly, you're responsible. So when you hire somebody else, it's still something you chose to do. And so if your trash is in the woods, then you're still responsible. Francis says if you hire someone to haul your trash, even if it's a family member or friend with a truck, don't pay them until you see a receipt from an official landfill. That way you know the trash was dumped legally. Also, she says, protect yourself and pay with a check. The best way you can help is if you're traveling down a road and you see garbage, um, call it in as soon as, you, as soon as you see it. And if you're hauling trash to the landfill, tarp it. It will save you money when you get there, and it'll keep your trash from accidentally ending up alongside a road, which can cost you several hundred dollars in fines. Isn't that irritating? Carolyn really does want your help, so be sure and go online if you see any kind of garbage out there or give them a call and report it, let them know where that is. Now we're going to go to Cresswell and talk about stormwater. Ooh, <laughs> I know what you're thinking. That sounds like something interesting. It really is. What they're doing down in Cresswell is a new program to get people involved in the process because when the water runs off your house, into your gutter, and down into the street, it's going into a river and there's something you can do about it. Water is the new gold. How we take care of our water matters. All of our water. Yes, even the water that runs into the storm drains. You know, like litter. Uh, yard waste is a pretty big one. Uh, pet waste. Um, even like oils or, or paint. Cliff Ballou sees firsthand what people allow or dump into Cresswell storm drains. I think people think that goes to the sewer plant and it gets treated, but it does not. It goes directly into a stream and either Garden Lake Park or Hills Creek, you know, it goes into a stream somewhere. Many people don't realize where the stormwater actually ends up. Let's face it, talking about stormwater is not the sexiest issue in the whole world. But what you put in your drain in your neighborhood here in Cresswell, a lot of that ends up here at Garden Lake Park and here in the South Fork of the Willamette River. Cresswell has 22 miles of actual storm drain pipes carrying water beneath the city and into small rivers and ponds that eventually lead to the river. Both creeks make it out to the Willamette. Much of the current stormwater system was developed in the 60s. When the idea was to pipe it and move it quickly, and now we know it's a little better to slow it down and let mimic natural systems. When you move storm water too quickly, it damages stream beds, resulting in water that is not healthy for fish or other aquatic life. The water that comes into the city is leaving it a little bit dirtier than when it came in, which isn't uncommon. So we just want to do our part. Many small cities are in the same boat. They need stormwater management plans and there is little help available. 
Cresswell and Cottage Grove have found a way to work together. I'm beginning with the city of Cottage Grove and then once I write it for Cottage Grove, Cresswell is interested in using that same plan but catering it to their needs. That template or plan can then be passed on to other small cities along the river. Temperature, bacteria and mercury levels are all major concerns. The first step cities have looked at is just having folks, it's just again the way it's always kind of been done is having the downspouts for houses run to the street. Um, so it's pretty simple to disconnect them and just do a little bit on your property and then there's like zero impact. It's pretty amazing. Things can be accomplished. Where do you put the water? This fall students at Cresslane Elementary will show you. They're taking this lawn in front of the school and creating a rain garden, a natural place to hold storm water. People in Cresswell can learn from their kids. Bag your lawn clippings, don't blow them out on the street or at least break them up, sweep them up. Um, if you wash your car and you're using uh, you know, degreasers or things like that, at least do it on your lawn so it doesn't run off directly into a catch basin. Um, you know, if, you're, if your vehicle's leaking oil, maybe get that fixed. At least do not change your oil on the curb, let it run out. Um, don't wash out your paint buckets into the catch basin, you know, just things of that nature. It's mostly common sense. The thing to remember is that stormwater does not disappear forever. It resurfaces untreated and right back in the rivers and lakes nearby. For more tips on how you can reduce your impact on the storm sewer system, watch the city website for details. This is just the beginning of the process in Cresswell. They have a lot of other things planned and we'll be showing you that when it happens. We're going to switch gears a little bit. My favorite topic. One of the things I've been doing since I left the news business is working for public awareness for people with disabilities. I have a brother-in-law who's disabled and so it's an important issue for me. And down where I live, near my home, before I had photographers working with me, I took my video camera one day and shot a story on a group called Right Able. Met a guy named George. Um, you're gonna meet him and I guarantee you're gonna like this little cowboy. George Beverly, not your typical cowboy, but boy does he like to ride. His days on horseback started way back in uh, March. That horse there changed his life. George is almost six years old. He has classic autism, which means he had it since birth. So the very first lesson, I swear Monica taught him the difference between left and right because he had a physical action to do with it. He understood it. He got the horse to do what he wanted and he was so proud of himself. Proud in a cowboy sort of way. George is in his element. I mean to be able to say something or do something and have the animal respond is huge and he loves it. He talks about Chica, his horse, all week long. Raising a child with a special ability is challenging and amazing especially on days like this. He is so capable. It doesn't seem like a disability. He just learns differently. All right, country boy. Say cheese. <laughs> George, George, you are funny. <laughs> has, your, has your definition of a disability changed? Oh, definitely. There aren't any. It's not a disability, it's a special need that you need to make some adjustments for, but it's not a disability. Julie Testy started riding with Ride Able a year ago. Julie told her doctor she needed something for the pain. The horse changed everything. I started riding the horse and the pain level has dropped, like 10 being worse, one being not, uh, nothing, it's dropped down to a two. And Julie's balance is better. It's hard to say why this relationship between these folks and these horses works. Okay. What's so, the magic? The what? horses. It's the relationship with the horses. It's that mystery relationship. Why are the horses important? Why, do, why does it work? I don't know why it works. I just know it does. It doesn't really matter why. Not to George, who's back at the hitching post, rides over for today. But this little cowboy knows he'll be back, because he's a country boy.
The best part about doing your own show is you can ask for money for people if you want to and nobody can tell you you can't do it, you can't have a command from on high. So from on high, this is as high as it gets, Ride Able needs money. They really need help to keep people riding horses out there at the stables. So look at the website here, contact them, give them some cash, tell them that you want to help them, go out there and do something for them. They really could use it. Now over the summer, my wife, my photographer, and myself all got to go to Alaska. I know, it's tough to be us. But you know what, that's what you do in the video world. We put together a special for them and we're gonna be showing that to you later. But tonight we have just a little two minute tease that we wanna show you just to kinda of get you in the mood to, to play in Alaska. It's like going back in time, I mean, this is like the lower 48 was 100 years ago. It's nature in its uh, simple form, you know, it's not the, uh, it's not the TV form. You know there's nobody for miles, I mean literally miles and miles, you're not going to see another soul. This is what we get to do out here. We get to show people wild Alaska, or just nature, I guess, in its truest sense. Because I think Alaska, for a lot of people, is a bucket list. It's one of those once-in-a-lifetime trips. I think it's something that words can't really express. It's beyond, it's beyond pictures, it's beyond words, it's beyond anything really tangible. Did you know one of the largest fire truck dealers in the state is right here in Springfield, Oregon? I didn't either, and I'm friends with the owner. <laughs> the funny thing is they hired us to go out and shoot a video of how you test a fire truck to make sure that everything works. You wouldn't want to get to a fire and have the hose not work. So they do this test, and we're going to show you that in a minute. But first, we were up in Seattle shooting some video of this fire truck. It's huge, and it's had over 80,000 hits on YouTube. Watch this. thousand hits for that. It wasn't even that long. That shows you short stuff. People want to see it. YouTube, it's a miracle. So now let's show you the video we were talking about with the fire truck equipment testing and just sit back and enjoy yourself because this is kind of fun. My name is Sonny Ovens and I work for Hughes Fire Equipment. I test fire pumps for a living and I love my job. We can either fill it from a fire hydrant or from a water tender. Today we're going to use a water tender. The test consists of several components. There's a dry vacuum test which tests the plumbing and makes sure there's no leaks. Uh, the second part of the test is a capacity pumping test. Make sure that your uh, truck can pump at the rated capacity. The last two tests are uh, additional tests that test the pump at different pressures. If you show up to a fire and the truck won't do its job, somebody's going to ask why and who and how did it get that way.
place. Uh, having your truck tested annually will ensure that when the time comes to use the truck that it will pump and perform and, and work at rated capacity. These are nozzles for the pitot, ranging from one inch all the way up to two and a half inches. Slide it into the nozzle holder, lock it into place, and put the pitot in front. And at that point, we are ready to test. So the first part of the test, we're pumping at capacity. So we're testing the, the maximum flow that the pump can flow. The next portion of the pumping test is 15% more than that. So we know that we're not right on the verge of failing. To find out more about us, visit our website at www.hughesfire.com or to schedule a mobile pump test, call us at 1-800-747-6510. We do a lot of work for restaurants too, Mozzie's, Full City, and a little place out of the way down in Cottage Grove called Fleur de Lis. Where else can you go to find a French Revolution happening right in Cottage Grove? I know, I'm not gonna explain. You'll see it in the story, I don't have to tell you. Long before the sun rises, Long before most of us are out of bed, Eric Jega is already working. I started with my brother in France. 2.30 in the morning, Eric, a French pastry chef, is rolling out the dough for his famous croissant. It's a secret. Butter. <laughs> Eric will not say the recipe is a secret. He and his partner, Maureen Rosenberger, opened Fleur de Lis Patisserie and Cafe in April of 2008. They had a bakery in Paris before they moved to the United States, him and his brother, and then in California they have the Paris Bakery, which has been there for almost 25 years. Fleur de Lis is revitalizing downtown Cottage Grove. Great food and great service can do that. Because it's authentic, it's the real deal. His recipes are the best, and he apprenticed under masters, pretty much, in Paris. Did a little bit of school, but mainly just apprenticed under the right people. And um, I think a Frenchman doing French pastry is huge. Fleur de Lis serves amazing sandwiches, homemade soups and salads, espresso, and desserts handmade French pastries. Some of the ingredients so rare they must be ordered from France. We fell in love with the little town and every time after that we would just visit because we liked coming here. We thought wouldn't it be great to put a bakery, a French bakery in this little town. Something, it was just a vibe that we had that they would, it would work. People are looking for fresh authentic food and a place that makes you feel welcome. Fleur de Lis serves it all. People told us don't do it in Cottage Grove, do it in Eugene, we don't think you can make it. And it was just, it wasn't a master business plan, it was a gut feeling. It was a true roll of the dice. It's like, oh my God, I hope people show up. And for weeks we had lines out of the door every day. And then business since then has just been truly word of mouth and it's like we've been here forever. And that only confirms for us, reaffirms for us, that we're meant to be here. I recently attended a memorial service where they were talking about the birth date and the death date on the tombstone. What we always forget about is the dash in the middle. It doesn't seem to matter, but really that's your life. Everything that happens between birth and death, that's where it is. And what you do really does matter, and how you do it matters. Far too many of us are afraid to step out of our comfort zone. Far too many people are afraid to leave what they were before because they're afraid of what they might become. And yet if you don't leave, you never take a risk, you never figure it out. Hopefully when you do, it won't be a train wreck.
We'll see you next time on Rick Dancer TV.